Wantrepreneur Wednesday. So my name is Patricia Cimino. I'm a life coach and I work with people. I work mostly, I work with women who um, are trying to discover the next chapter of themselves. And uh, over the last year, I, a lot of my clients have gone through this process of discovering what's next and they've decided to venture into entrepreneurship. So I created this mini series for all of you, all of my fans out there and all my friends on Facebook, for anyone who's interested in um, learning more about different entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs that I've been interviewing that are just rocking their businesses. So today I want to introduce to you um, a newer friend of mine and I'll tell you how I met her in just a minute, but her name is Maureen Muldoon and um, Maureen, She's an amazing person. She's, she, she will identify as an artist where I'm identifying her as an entrepreneur. And we were talking earlier and we were saying how those two, it's kind of synonymous, those two things. But um, my husband and I were jogging one Sunday morning and we happened to pass this little church in Hinsdale. It was, uh, it's called Emmanuel Lutheran, Emmanuel Hall. And, uh, and I never had seen people in there. And so I said to my husband, wait a minute, there's some people in there. Let's go check it out and see what they're doing. We kind of peeked our heads in and then kind of walked away. And a gentleman who was walking into the church said to us, hey, come on in. All are welcome here. <laughs> and we were sweating in our jogging clothes. We went in and uh, Maureen was giving her sermon. And it really was... a. a uplifting and I had this connection to what she was talking about and it just it just it felt right it felt so good to be in her presence and some of the stuff she was talking about because everything she was talking about was about love right bringing everything back to love so I want to introduce to you Maureen Muldoon who is a spiritual director and author she's written this book and now we'll raise it up again in a few minutes and she's a former actress from Hollywood, spent 20 years in Hollywood. I'm not going to say anymore. I'm going to take it away. Welcome, <laughs> Maureen. Tell my audience who you are and what it is that you do in your artistic business world. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I love, 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 love your enthusiasm, your brightness, your, I mean, and I remember, I remember the, one of the first times that we met, you were like, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I do these things too, and I feel kind of self-conscious around it, and, um, and you know, and we both, I was like, yeah, that's it. I mean, that's going to travel with us wherever we go. There's always going to be this, like, who am I to say these things and be this coach, and you know, so it's just interesting how universal that story is, and and how when we look at it, we can laugh at it and be like, oh, we're going to do it anyhow. So I started out like I was sharing as an as an actress, and I was saying to Patricia that one of the, what I think is the, the first entrepreneurs were artists, because as an artist, as an actress in Hollywood, you know, not only was I, uh, I went in it for the craft of acting, which I love, you went in it for the craft of helping people as a life coach, and then you have to do all these other things of running a business and figuring out the finances and figuring out the budget and <laughs> making sure that it doesn't drain your family, your craft doesn't drain your family. So, um, and that you move into a professional level of the work that you do um, for nothing else but because, uh, you know, that it's more helpful. You know, you can just be more helpful um, the more that you work on that end of the business. And um, so w w I learned how to wear the hats of being an entrepreneur through uh, working as an actress. And then I got licensed as a spiritual life coach in Hollywood, and I've been a licensed spiritual practitioner for 10 years. And then I came to Chicago and opened up a spiritual center and began writing. Actually, writing is what took me from Los Angeles to Chicago. I wrote a play called um, Booby Trap, the very best show in town. And and it was for breast cancer and it, you know, it was a really great, it's a really great show. We played it every September. It was in honor of my mom who passed away from breast cancer and all of the money went to these different organizations that help women um, deal with their um, breast cancer and, you know, and help them out. And then someone from Elmhurst College came 
and saw the play and said, could we do this for our college? And I was like, where is it? And so I sent them the script and the music and everything and they performed it and I came out here and I had this visceral feeling of, I'm supposed to move here. <laughs> it's like, you know, so, um, so that's how I ended up coming here and jumping ship from acting and becoming, you know, a spiritual director. Oh kind of funny. I know. So tell me, you do a lot of things and I want you to explain to the audience, um, all the different things that you do, because I can't keep track. You know what? She keeps showing up everywhere this girl. She's, she's got workshops. She's got, you know, coaching services. She's got her spiritual center that she talks about and a weekly sermon that she does. She's got art, artist, you know, classes for writing. Tell everybody everything that you're doing and how everything kind of manifested. And it really is a business now, right? I mean, all these things. Oh, yeah. Together. Yeah, I think um, the two main things that I do or the two pillars of everything I do are spirituality and creativity. And all of them based around finding your voice and getting people to speak their truth. My real passion is getting women to speak their spirit, to, to engage with their spiritual authority. So being a spiritual authority in my community, um, it wasn't easy. You know, there's a lot of resistance. Who, you know, there was no model for it when I grew up. You know, if I wanted to be a priest, I had all the wrong body parts. And um, there was no way to get through the gate. You know what I mean? So, um, so, and then when I began to move into my own spiritual authority, there was a lot of res internal resistance. Like first there was the external resistance of women don't do that. And then the, by the time I got to the place where I was ready, there was that internal thing of like, God, you're choosing the wrong person. Like I curse and wear tube tops and like, this is, you could pick somebody else for sure. <laughs> and, um, but you know, when you, when you, you know, feel that pull and that desire, you can fight it all you want, but it's best to, you know, surrender. And so we all, we all face resistances when it comes to our higher calling, I think. So anyway, I, um, I do speak, speak easy, which is a community that honors all paths to God, um, where I invite people after the talk to talk about it. So we're not just, I'm not just feeding them and letting them go off and think about it. I'm actually inviting them. What do you think? What do you have to say? And if there was a motto of my life, it would be, what do you think? What do you have to say? Um, for voice box, it's the same thing. It's a story event that we do once a month at Fitzgerald's in, um, in Berwyn. And I work with my partner, Kathy Richardson, who's this amazing artist. Um, she's the singer of Jefferson Starship. And we um, create this night of storytelling and music once a month. And again, just getting people up on stage who have never been on stage before, who have sworn to me that they would rather die than get on stage is awesome because no one's died yet. <laughs> and so and and in fact most people get up and they tell their story and they hear the first laughter or the first engagement with community and they go oh, I want to do this again and that's so beautiful to hear like wow there is something that was laying latent within you that wanted and needed to be expressed and think about it like in this time we are so you and I you know tied to these screens um, where we're having these almost one-way monologue um, interactions. And so th the things that I do is bring people back to the campfire, you know, spiritually and community and creatively. Um, the morning call uh, is a morning coaching call that I do based on A Course of Miracles. It's called Miracles Live 365. It's a wonderful call. It sets my day. I'm on it on the mornings with her. It is the yeah. best 15 minutes of the day. And when you ask about like, what was your best mistake? I think that was my best mistake because I went into it. Um, I was asked to give a couple talks at the Bodhi Spiritual Center on A Course in Miracles. And I was taking a business course at the time and it said, if you get hired for something and they're not paying you enough, add more value. And I was like, okay, how can I add more value to this product of these, this series of talks? And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk people through the first 21 days of this workbook. There's a workbook that comes with it that's 365 days. And I'm gonna charge a dollar a day. And a ton of people signed up because they wanted to go a little bit deeper and tip their toe into it without engaging for 365 days. So, so I started um, the 21 days and then the people on the call said, let's go the distance. And so it was just really a very happy mistake that's been going on for five years now when I thought it was 21 days. That's a great, that was a great mistake. I'm glad you, you, you uh, yeah. made it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know how this, this came about. This is her book that she just released, A Giant Love Song. 
It's a memoir. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, that story, that, the main story of that is that when I was 14, my mom had breast cancer and she was dying. And um, I saw you know, the train coming down the tracks. I knew that this was going to happen. And I really and truly believed that her death would take me with it. Like I didn't think I could live in a world without my mom. And I know that sounds like poetic and romantic, but it was really visceral too. It was like, I don't, you know, I don't, I have to deny this with everything that I have. So I, you know, set about like um, denying it and being in resistance and staying, you know, trying to stay my normal course of life, even when they were bringing in the hospital beds and they're bringing in the morphine and all of my aunts are showing up. And, you know, it's the final day of her life. And, um, I go off to school on the final day of her life and I come back home and my dad at the um, tells me the story. And my father was this giant in our house of little women. There was, I had six older sisters and my mom and they're all really short little women. And then my dad would come home, this big giant and he, um, he scared the heck out of me. And he did his, his PR wasn't helped by the fact that my mom would be constantly saying like, wait, your dad gets home, you know? So it was like, he just, we had this, I was afraid of him. So he sat next to me and my two brothers um, at, at, at her deathbed. And he told me a story about his mom and how he had gone through the very same thing that when he was around 14, his mom had died of breast cancer. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe, first of all, that my dad was once a boy. Like, I just didn't have the the um, bigger thought of that yet. I just always saw my dad as a man. And I couldn't believe that somebody was sitting in my shoes and, and lived to tell. And it was the first time, like, you know, I had gone to the priests. I had gone to the teachers. I had gone to the neighbors. And they all, you know, told me what they could to help me with my situation. But it, was, it wasn't until I, I listened to my father, who had lived through it, that I... I had a, re- a realization that I could live through this too. And that's what, that's why I'm so passionate about storytelling. You know, I think, you know, there's that story about the guy falls in the hole and he feels stuck and he calls up and he says, you know, help me out. And a priest comes by and writes out a prayer and throws it in the hole and he reads the prayer, but nothing happens. And then a doctor walks by, he's like, help me out. And he writes out a prescription and he throws it in the hole, but nothing happens. And Finally, his friend walks by and he's like, help me out. And the friend jumps in the hole with him. And he's like, what are you doing in the hole? And he's like, I, I've been here. I know the way out. Oh, my gosh. You know? So it, it's like those are the – that's what coaching is. You know, yeah. coaching is just like – it's not about having some special handshake or, you know, special prayer. It's about I've been here before. And – um, and, I, I, and like you were saying earlier, like you only have to be a few footsteps ahead of your clients to be helpful. Yep. And um, so that book came from my passion of, of storytelling. And that's when I realized storytelling, a, a well-placed story, a well-placed story could save your life. A well-placed story could save somebody a whole lot of pain. And um, that's when I became really passionate about, um, about, about telling stories. That's so cool because that, it sounds like your spirituality has been a part of your whole life. Yeah, I'm, my mom was very spiritual. My house was like immersed in prayers. My mom, we lived a block from the church, Catholic church, Catholic school. We went to Catholic school. I mean, yeah, we were very spiritual, praying like all the time, doing the rosy, the whole nine yards. But it wasn't until, um, you know, that I went through 12 step that I got a God of my own understanding, which was such a huge chunk of freedom. You know, that I let go of this this God where that was like looking at me as a sinner, as a broken person that I had to kind of like live up to or fake it to to um, to earn grace. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, so, yeah, but it's been traveling with me, I think, since I first started breathing. That's, That's cool. cool. So, so let me ask you, you, uh, you, you everything you're doing, doing uh, different things, they all relate back to you know, your, your main mission, right? Yeah. Of spreading what it is that you believe to be true. Um, and it's become your business, right? So tell me, tell the audience, you know, what, what, what have been some of the challenges? Cause the challenges of creating this business, because yeah. there's so many different arms to it. And because it is spiritual, sometimes I know people in that arena get hung up on, charging money for something that is oh, yeah. yeah so is that something that you encounter as you well you know when i went through when i went through um 
the program to become a licensed spiritual practitioner, that was something that they gave us in the program. You know, that there has to be some sort of an exchange. And even though the, I know that to be true, it is, even if you're not spiritual, it's still hard earning your worth. I mean, and speaking your worth and saying that my time, my energy, my expertise is worth something. And especially, you know, even taking the whole spiritual thing away from it, just being being a, per, a human being who has like great tools that could really help you. Like, yeah, it does feel like don't like be stingy with mustard, just give it all away, <laughs> you know? But what I've come to find is that I have given it all the way. You know, I have been a whore with my own, you know, treats and talents and just like giving them out. And they're not people. Don't comes in their well being and they do, they have an exchange and it's you know when i first started i charged 30 dollars a session and it was like pulling teeth and i got all of these people who were like not really invested and the more i raised my price the less it became a problem and so i i was like i it was hard to raise my price but every time that i did i was like wow these are the people i actually want to work with you yeah, know committed yeah, ones. yeah. 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 So, um, so that was it. That was a lesson that I learned, but you know, you, that, that's an, that's a very personal, um, decision, what you charge and you know, what your time is worth. But, um, I think it's one of the most valuable things that, that could happen. You know, I think it's one of the most valuable things you can invest in. And it's funny how sometimes the things that I think are most valuable, like spirituality, like education are like those people who will get paid the least. When I was an actress, Holy mackerel. Like I had like rain gods of money falling on me for doing nothing. You know what I mean? I mean, I won't say it was, it, but there was like, you know, I would do a commercial and just be paid the whole year. Like there's so much money in the world that it, to allocate some of it for your well being is not a horrible thing. You know? I mean, we invest more in fancy shoes. At least I know I have. So I kind of got, got over the idea that, uh, that stigma of you shouldn't charge for this. Because that's not, it, it's not something I believe. And I, and I actually pay for spiritual support and I pay for, you know, coaching. So, um, so I, you know, so that's just, I, I feel very clean about that. You know, it is something that I, and, and if somebody does, has a problem with it, that's okay. Like they're probably not going to be my client. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Um, because you know, a lot of what I talk about is mindset when, when life gets really hairy for you, what, what, um, how do you, what are the things that you're thinking and believing that get you through those really difficult times? Well, um, I, I made a decision a couple of years ago that I was not going to do anything that I couldn't do in peace. And that was a total game changer for me. Um, like I was thinking that I was running the show, that I was doing all the doing and that if I didn't do it, it wouldn't get done. And then finally, I was like, wait, wait a second. Like, I work, I work for a higher power, you know? And, uh, and then, and because of that, my benefits are insured by grace. And, and God doesn't need an unhappy calling card or a frazzled calling card or a frustrated calling card. So um, that was a big a game changer for me. And another thing that was a big game changer for me was that I stopped thinking that I knew what people wanted. You know, I just started listening, like even with my own community, I was like, we're going to have a kick-ass youth program. It's going to be so great. And I already have the curriculum because I implemented it at other spiritual communities. And I was like, I have this and, and I was pushing the ball forward. And then I was like, wait a second, nobody has asked me for this. <laughs> nobody, nobody else cares about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and so I stopped trying to think of what my client or my you know, congregation needed. And then even just recently I was thinking, Oh, uh, you know, I have this, I have this free time right now. I should probably be doing this working on this program. And somebody called and said, I want to, I want to take an affirmative prayer class. It wasn't something that I planned to do at all. And I thought, yeah, I don't, I'm not doing that right now. But I remembered like, do what your client wants you to do. So I was like affirmative prayer class. Okay. I could do that in two sessions. And um, if that's really what you want, I prayed on it. Is that something I can do right now? Yes. 
I called like five other people. Are you interested in going deeper with this conversation? Yeah. By the time I was done, it was two days. I had 11 people in my class. I'm teaching what I love to teach. You know what I mean? And But I'm not teaching it because I want to teach it. I'm teaching it because they asked for it. It was such, I mean, it's, it's amazing when I stopped trying to push my own agenda forward, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm sure I'll learn it a million more times, but yeah, I hope not. So, um, so tell me, if a woman was thinking about starting a business, right, or entering into this entrepreneurial world, what would be the best piece of advice that you would give her? Um, well, I think um, the number one question is, would you do it in the dark, in the middle of the night with nobody watching? You love it so much. Like, do you, are you really in love with it? And if you're really in love with it, that's 50% of a big yes. You know, if you're really in love with it, that's going to get a lot of gas in your tank to move through all of the things you're going to have to learn, all of the resistance of, you know, your own fears or your family's fears. You know, that that's going to, if you don't, if you're not 100% in love with it, that it just keeps you up at night and makes you want to jump out of bed then I would say that's kind of a back burner thing and wait until you find something that you're really in love with. I think a lot of times people see an idea of, of a business or see uh, someone else doing, you know, teaching yoga or doing this or doing that. And they go, Oh, I want to do that. But, uh, but you know what you're really called to do. Like there's, there's a, a, there's a real clarity that you can tap into. And so I would say get still and make sure that this is a full body, a hundred percent. Yes. Because it's like having a baby. You just said something. So what was it with you that you felt, at what point did you feel this calling to go to get certified to be a spiritual director coming from Hollywood and having a career there and all that? Yeah, I was in Los Angeles um, and I had always been very spiritual and very thirsty, like very spiritually thirsty. And so what happened was, but I never identified with spiritual authority because, again, I didn't have models for that. I just didn't think that that was in my, I just thought, you know what, the truth is, I saw priests on the altar telling stories that changed people's lives. And I thought, and I asked my teachers, how do you become a priest? They're like, you can't, you're a girl. <laughs> so I looked back on the menu and I was like, how can I be on stage, tell stories that shift people's lives? Oh, I can be an actress. Oh, interesting. So that the, the content was the same, but what you called it was something different. Mm -hmm. And then I was laying, uh, and then and that worked for a long time. Like that was like I could, I could be a spiritual being in disguise as an actress. And and then uh, and then one day I was on the set of Dexter, and I had been murdered. And I was starting to feel like I don't want to go on these auditions anymore. I'm done with acting. I don't know what to do. I've been doing this for twenty four. You know, I've been doing this twenty four seven. I looked up at the ceiling. There was like blood all over the place, and I thought, I, I think I'm supposed to be doing something different. And that was the last job. That was my last job that I booked. I literally was killed. <laughs> Oh my gosh. But you know what I did? You know what I also did at the same time? And it's a spiritual tool, but I did the prayer of Jabez, which is from the Bible. And the prayer of Jabez is about extending your consciousness and seeing things new because I didn't know. Like I said, such a blind spot about moving into spiritual authority that I, and I knew I didn't want to be an actress anymore. And I was living in the middle of this. I was living on the fence and it was really painful. I was like, I really don't want to be on these auditions anymore. And I don't know what else I could do. Um, uh, so, the prayer of Jabez says, um, Lord, that you'll bless me indeed, expand my territory, that your hand will be with me, and that you'll keep me from fear that it will not cause pain. And the part about expand my territory is like expand my consciousness so I can see past my blind spots. And I was doing this prayer for like a couple weeks when my sister Mary called me, and she's like, hey, I got this, I got this gig for you down in Texas to speak in front of, you know, these high school students and their teachers as an, as a motivational, you know, speaker. And I was like, I'm not, I'm an actress. Like, I don't do that. I'm like, get my husband to do that. He's really funny. And at the time it was like 800 high school students. And I was like, no way. And, um, but I remembered that I had been doing this prayer and I was like, I think I'm supposed to, I think this is my next step. Like, I think I'm supposed to do this. And then she kept calling back and saying, it's not 800, it's a thousand. Oops, I made a mistake. It's not a thousand, it's 2000. Oops, I'm sorry. They changed it around. It was 8,000 high school students and their teachers by the time she was done. And I'm walking through this amphitheater that's two football fields wide with not, no training, <laughs> never, no like Toastmasters, like nothing. And I'm walking with her and I'm like, what? 
and and then and I had notes because I did work on this talk. It was the talk. The first talk that I ever gave was called "The Wave of the Future," and so, but really, I was so green. And uh, I walked. Uh, I met the guy backstage, and I said, um, he, "He looked at my notes. He goes, what are those?' I go, "These are my notes." He goes, "You can't bring those on stage. You don't need them." And I had such like an ego and a people pleasing thing that I was like, "Okay." <laughs> And I was like, holy dear God, be with me. So um, I went out on stage and I began to tell the story that I had worked on and I forgot something. And I said, and so for for whatever reason, I said to the audience, like, do you know that actor who's blah, blah, blah? And all of a sudden, like 2,000, you know, 8,000 people answered me. And I was like, oh, and I was like, oh, we're just having a conversation. Like, it's not that scary. Uh, so, um, you know, sometimes God does for you what you're not willing to do for yourself and just pushes you into things. And isn't that what life coaching is all about too, is sort of like pushing people a little bit off the cliff. So, um, so yeah, so that was, but the fun thing is standing over felt like I was in the right place. I made a commitment that I was never going to do that again. Like I literally got off stage and I said to my sister, don't ever do that to me again. I'm not doing this. And so even though the Holy Spirit or God was really clear about this is your next right step, I, again, I went back under and I was like, that's not for me. I literally thought it was idolatry. Like that's what I thought. I was like, I'm like the emperor's new clothes. This was just a fluke. I shouldn't be doing this. And so I was wrestling with my calling. I, you know, it's kind of funny. And then it was like two years of being in Chicago where, I, you know, uh, the minister would come down to the, I was working in the youth in the basement, like literally subconscious in the basement. And he would come down and say, what's your big dream? And I'd be like, I did it already in Hollywood. It's done. And he's the one who gave me that series of talks. He's the one who invited me to give a series of talks on, on, um, on miracles, um, on the course of miracles. So it's interesting that even when you're in resistance, it will reach in and grab you. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Oh, gosh, Maureen, thank you so much for sharing everything that you're doing. Can you tell um, my audience where they can find your offerings, how you work with people, where your websites, uh, things that you have going on, where the spiritual community is located, all that, because we have a lot of local people watching. Thank you so much for having me on. I just adore you. I wish you the best in all the amazing things that you're doing. You're such a bright light, and I really appreciate just having this time with you. Um, you can get my book off of Amazon, Giant Love Song. It's a great summer read. <laughs> um, you can join us at Speakeasy Spiritual Community at the um, Village Club of Western Springs. And again, it's a great way to start to um, find your own spiritual voice and hear what you have to say and hear what other people have to say. And um, Voice Box Stories is an event over at Berwyn. And then we do have Miracles Live 365, which is a morning coaching call based on A Course in Miracles. It kicks off twice a year. Once in July, uh, July 1st, and once in January 1st. So if you've ever been curious about A Course in Miracles, which is a program that moves you from fear into love, um, this would be one way to do it. And uh, if you have any other questions, you can contact me at MaureenMuldoon.com. Yeah, you also do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. as well. I do. I do. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for taking time out on your Wednesday to listen to my mini-series with Maureen today. As you can see, each week it's different from, you know, women who've got bricks and mortars to women who are, you know, selling intangible things like services, like spirituality, right? It's all these different types of, of offerings from all these amazing women. So I hope you've been benefiting and enjoying them. Um, if you like this interview, share it. Somebody you know might need to hear this, might be inspired by this. I'd love for you to share this out. Throw some hearts on it if you're watching it in replay. And um, if you're going through a, a place in your life right now where there's a little unclarity on what you are thinking about doing, I have a certain amount of clarity calls that I host every month. You can check it out at my website, patriciachimino.com, and book a clarity session that's complimentary and see where your life might lead you. Have an amazing rest of your day.